I'm Mark Halperin. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to Ben Carson, we just discovered the incredible fact that you love <laughs> Happy World Series game number two slash GOP debate number three day sports fans. We are live Rocky Mountain High and I do mean high in Boulder, Colorado for the latest Republican square dance. And we've double checked our trucks to make sure our feed stays up for our entire show. At the last two debates, Donald J. Trump was the man. Tonight, however, he will be Siamese sharing the lead lectern with Dr. Ben Carson. Mark, who you got? Look, I think the questions tonight are going to be detailed and specific on the economy. If Ben Carson gives decent answers, people are going to say, wow, he knows a lot. The bar, he set the bar so low because he's been so unspecific. And I think there's a fair amount of pressure on Trump to figure out how much he goes after Carson, but also can he take advantage of the fact that in a business-oriented debate, as a businessman, he should do pretty this well. This is the debate that Donald Trump should dominate in. He, is the, he and Carly Fiorina should kill it tonight. That's a, a, that, that is, this should be home turf for them. Ben Carson, I know you and I may disagree about this a little bit, this recent interview he did on NPR with Steve Inskeep about the debt ceiling versus the debt and the deficit, uh, I, I thought he was a dangerously, seemed dangerously in over his head. Yeah. He could commit a faux pas tonight that could set him back a long way. I don't think his supporters will care. Maybe and, not, and this, 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 but a lot of other people this will. This group of people, of, 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 of which you are apparently one, you think that Ben Carson is stupid and ignorant, you, you all, I didn't you say all it was, I think, are wrong. No, wait, I, no, of course no. he knows the difference I, between the debt and the deficit. Uh, not, it, was not, it, was not, it was not evident in this interview. Right. He had them totally because, confused. Because he, a guy enough. asked the question three times in a row. I didn't say he was stupid or ignorant, but there are a lot of people who don't know the difference between the debt and deficit, he and he seemed to be one of them. He knows the difference. Well, he's gonna, he he tonight let, then demonstrate it. He has a chance tonight to exceed expectations, and Trump, I think, has a chance to maybe box Carson in a little bit. My guess is, from the way Trump's been acting all day today, from the reports I've heard, but also over the last couple of days, that he's going to want to try to school Carson a little bit. And we'll see what the moderators do. They have a ton of power, as we say every debate day. Yes. Do they try to make this a Trump-Carson thing to some extent? It is impossible for Donald Trump to not go after someone who he perceives to be ahead of him in some way, in some Carson state, Rapp. on some metric. He's going to he's gonna get remember, in there with the needle in. he doesn't see Carson. I know, but he's got to be able to resist. He, he can't right. resist. There is a little inside secret that not a lot of the insiders in Republican politics think that in the end, Ben Carson and Donald Trump are going to end up as their party nominee. In the view of the establishment, it's going to end up being Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, maybe Ted Cruz. Those three rank just below the outsider front runners by some measures and ahead of them by others. So, John, for Bush, for Cruz, for Rubio, what would represent a breakthrough moment tonight? Well, the key word there is moment. And I, I, I you know, it, it, each of them has different things they're trying to accomplish, but it's all about the moments, right? And I think the, obviously the stakes in some ways are highest for Jeb Bush, uh, given the trajectory of his campaign. Ted Cruz is the one who I think has the easiest bar to clear because although we've been talking about the fact that he's he's undervalued as a stock most people out there in the world don't think that and so if he had a big moment tonight he could really vault himself forward i think cruz if he talks about the middle class and the working class would be really smart because that's where i think he's underperforming and if he seems extent. human in a way always bush doesn't i don't think really wants a single breakthrough moment what bush wants is from his campaign's point of view, they're already pre-spinning it. He wants an overall commanding thing. Right. Every answer, I'm a president, I'm presidential, I'm ready. And Rubio, I think, has to show that he can play with the big guys and the big gals. He's not done that yet. He's had performances that people have rated strong, but he's not been dominating. I'm interested to see who else on the stage decides to go after Bush right now. You know, last debate, it was all Trump versus Bush, Bush versus Trump. Now, Bush is so far down on his luck right now that there may be other candidates in the establishment lane who, like Trump, smell blood in the water and decide that this is an opportunity for a Kasich uh, to go after Jeb Bush to try and take him, here's, just take him out here's, tonight. Here's the thing I think Trump, the kind of thing I think Trump might not be able to resist saying. Governor Bush, I'm very surprised you showed up to debate tonight because I don't see your mommy and daddy in the audience. Oh my God. If, if Trump baits Bush, who he still sees as a huge threat to him because of the super PAC money, yeah. What does Bush do? I don't think Bush wants to have another debate where the storyline is Trump best Bush. I'm not sure he can, he can avoid he it, though. Avoid and he's not been able to not take the Trump's bait any other Mom time in the past. In the Very difficult. Okay, now it's time for the and the rest crowd, as they like to say on our favorite show, Gilligan's Island. That's Carly Fiorina, Mike Huckabee, Rand Paul, Chris Christie, John Kasich, the professor, and Marianne. Fiorina, of course, won the last debate. So the question is how she'll fare tonight. Huckabee is planning a four-day swing through Iowa after this. 
Uh, Rand Paul, he did an interview with Larry Wilmore to try out some your mama jokes on Trump, and he's going to be with us shortly. Christy, he's apparently upset about his green room. And then there's John Kasich, God bless that man, who went all Howard Beale yesterday in Ohio. Let's listen to a little part of that rant. I've about had it with these people. <laughs> and let me tell you why. We got one candidate that says that we ought to abolish Medicaid and Medicare. You ever heard of anything so crazy as that? Telling our, our people in this country who are seniors or about to be seniors that we're going to abolish Medicaid and Medicare? We got one person saying we ought to have a 10% flat tax that will drive up the, the deficit in this country by trillions of dollars that my daughters will spend the rest of their lives having to pay off. You know what I say to them is why don't we have no taxes? Just get rid of them all and then a chicken in every pot on top of it. Mark, let's be clear. I know what a breakout moment would look like for the professor or Marianne. They just have to show up. But for the rest of these, what would a breakout moment look like for one of them? Those five, all these five, in order all to be part of the storyline, have to be big. You see in John Kasich there, I think this is more tactical than pure frustration. Yeah. But there's no doubt he's frustrated. I think tonight you're going to see him do that. He's going to denounce, if not by name and directly, he's going to denounce what he sees as the superficiality of the race. Christie, Rand Paul. Carly Fiorina, who was such a focus of the last debate, Mike Huckabee, I think they need to they need to dominate the floor. And I think all of them recognize that the moderators are unlikely to give them equal time. They need to fight their way in. I think they're all past the time when they're like, you know what, if I wait, I'll eventually get called on and get my time. I'm interested to see what happens with two people, Kasich, who you mentioned, uh, because of the fact that his situation seems to be deteriorating. He's not gaining ground in New Hampshire, even though he spent a lot of money up there, his super PAC has. He's not gaining the kind of ground he'd hoped to have gained by this point. Right. The other person is Carly Fiorina, who, as we said, won the last debate with a clear, the big moment of the night. She has had a good period since then in the last month. Except but now, in the polls. She's well, not in the yet. Polls. In the polls, she's gone. She went up and then she came back down. What's she going to do tonight for an encore? Yep. That's my question. question. Okay. And now for something completely different, Democrats. Today, Mark and I both had pieces up at BloombergPolitics.com. His is about Bill Clinton, the big dog, getting involved in securing superdelegates for his wife. And mine is all about the Bernie Sanders campaign and how it plans to take that very same woman down. Uh, that story and their discussion of what they were going to do apparently provoked Hillary up in New Hampshire today, where she said, quote, we're all on the same team at the end of the election, Republicans or Democrats or whatever else we might call ourselves. We're all Americans. So, Mark, my question to you is, with Hillary Clinton still on a roll, does the Sanders campaign, in your view, have a plausible plan to come back? I'm interested to see if he ups his game in the next couple of debates, particularly now that he's more comfortable going after her on contrast a little bit. This notion of negative personal, it's never going to be that. No. It's going to be contrast on issues. I think it's Iowa and New Hampshire. That's what they think. Your piece makes yeah. that clear. Whatever else is going on with Hillary Clinton, She's getting a lot of superdelegates. Jen Epstein and I are reporting. She's added scores of superdelegates to her total since we last got a window into where they were in August. It's still about Iowa and New right. Hampshire. Sanders is very gingerly now, since he didn't mention her to JJ. Since then, he mentions her now. He uses her name. There was some lack of clarity about whether he'd do that. But still, you and I both know, on 10 issues, he could contrast her and say, I'm more with the party than she is, or she's now with me where she never was before. The question is, do they do that kind of what would be in any normal campaign, Coke versus Pepsi, straight ahead, issues driven, contrast advertising and paid media on in free media. Do they go all in on that? That's still an open question to me. But if he's going to really come back, I think he has to go all the way there. Front runners sometimes lose because they're complacent. Brooklyn is not complacent. No. Bobby Mook is not complacent. Hillary Mook. Clinton. Mook. Bill Clinton, not complacent. Mook. Like, they Mook. understand they're fighting. And Hook. All right. We've got an interview with Rand Paul and, and then many, Cook. many other guests coming up. They're going to wish our show was an hour every day which it will be starting on Monday. We'll be right back here in Boulder, Colorado with Debate Hoopla live before the third Republican debate after this. In Donald Trump's view, Rand Paul shouldn't even be at this debate because of his standing in the polls. But Rand Paul is here even if he's going to end up standing at one of the lecterns on the outer edge of the stage. A little earlier today, I spoke with Senator Paul about the big show tonight and about his energy level going into it. How's your adrenaline, adrenaline level compared to the first two? Um, you know, we're trying to bring it up a notch. <laughs> you know, we don't want to be accused of being low energy. Right. So uh, we're going to bring it, bring it all. Um, what did you achieve in the earlier debates? 
You know, I think uh, setting forth a position, what I've been trying to do since I ran for office, is that I'm concerned about our government because we're accumulating so much debt. And that really, I think I'm the only fiscal conservative in the race because most of the rest want to greatly expand military spending. And that's part of the problem. Frankly, I don't think you can ever balance any budget unless you're willing to consistently be against new spending for military or domestic. That's kind of what's going on in Washington right now. The Republican establishment made a deal with President Obama to bust the budget caps on both. So you had people on the right wanting for more money, people on the left wanting for more money, but they're going to blow a hole in the deficit, and it's wrong. And I'm the only one really that's speaking out against it. I understand your principled opposition to the deal, but do you understand the polit why some Republicans, even who are fiscal conservatives, find it politically attractive? It's the reverse of the compromise you need. The compromise in Washington you need is we borrow a million dollars a minute. Right and left should both say about their sacred cows, you know what? We need to reduce spending in each of them. But you know what they're doing? They're compromising and increasing the spending for both of their sacred cows, and that's what's bankrupting the country. President Paul would do it differently, but we have a President Obama right now. Yeah. So again, I understand your principled position on it. In but 2011, we did the opposite. Yeah. In 2011, the president said, I won't negotiate with a gun to my head, and then he promptly negotiated. They got the sequester, and the sequester held the line to the right and to the left. It said military and domestic spending, we have to hold the line, and then we abandoned it. This package that they put together is an abandonment by the Republican establishment of any kind of conception of fiscal responsibility. It's awful, it's rotten, I'm gonna filibuster it, I will do anything I can to stop it because they're destroying the country with debt. Would it make more sense to leave the debate and go back to D.C.? I will. I'm going back on 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, there won't be any votes till I get back there on this, but I'll be speaking on the Senate floor tomorrow afternoon on this. You don't have much in common with Mr. Trump at this point, but you both say that sometimes polling's inaccurate. It doesn't matter. He's now saying he's better than I within the poll show. You, you and your supporters argue the polls don't represent your support. Explain that from a methodological, scientific, well, the mathematical The polling is not inaccurate. It's irrelevant, because what you're doing is you're polling undecided voters. Look at the polls. Every one of the polls that are put out there as science or as math, three-fourths of the people in the polls are undecided. So it's really how are people leaning in an undecided poll. Now, if you come to January and you tell me 90% of the people in the polls are going to vote and they've made a decision, I'd be worried if this is where we were. But these are going to fluctuate wildly. Anybody that's covered any presidential elections uh, remembers Herman Cain, was leading at this point, didn't win a primary. Rudy Giuliani led for five months, never won a primary. Hillary Clinton was 27 points ahead of Barack Obama in 2007. So polls can change quite a bit, particularly when you're polling undecided people. It's a mistake to consider them to be math or factual. Am I wrong to be surprised at how relatively money you've, little money you've raised compared to some of the other candidates? Depends on how you count it. I mean, if you count total money, we've raised about 20 million. We have raised, uh, I think we're the fifth. We're sort of in the middle of the pack. And uh, we have $2 million cash on hand. We're very frugal. Uh, while other campaigns are cutting back, we're reinforcing our staff at this point. So we actually have a great deal of strength that I think has been underappreciated. Last question. What are two issues you hope you get a chance to address tonight that you'd like the American people to hear from you on? I want everybody to know that I'm willing to stand up against adding new debt, that I'm a fiscal conservative, and frankly, I'm the only fiscal conservative on the stage. Senator, thanks so much. Good luck tonight. Get that adrenaline up. Yes, got to be high energy. <laughs> Our thanks to Senator Paul. We do wish him and everybody else luck tonight. What do you think, Rand Paul? Well, it's, he was the, he's been the candidate who has most underperformed. He was a guy who could have been, thought to have been, potentially a transformational candidate in terms of the electorate, reaching out to new voters, independent voters. Hasn't done that. We just now are starting to see a little bit of an uptick in Iowa for him, though. Just when people are starting to think he was dead, what do you think about his prospects there? He's got a lot of confidence, and that's something he needs. We'll see what happens. All right, we'll be right back with Dan Baltz and Josh Green after this word from our sponsors. Hey, it's Marco. Hey, what's, what's the latest on Cruz? I know, but is he in or is he out? Because I keep seeing reports here about both. Okay, well, see what you can find out, please. And what about Bush? Because he's been kind of quiet this year, but you never know with this guy. Yeah, you think we should look at who? Carson? Look, I know he started the year as a sleeper, but he's really thrown the ball around lately pretty good. 
All right, that's fine. Victor Cruz, Reggie Bush, and Carson Palmer. Let's keep an eye on all those guys and let me know, okay? Yeah, I know I have a debate, but I gotta get this fantasy football thing right. Okay, bye. The comedy stylings of Marco Rubio flexing his funny bone before tonight's debate on his favorite topic, football. Uh, let's be honest, it's a little bit of like self... Uh, self. He likes comedy and football. All right, joining us now to talk about what they're looking for here in Boulder, Colorado, Washington Post Chief Correspondent Dan Balls and our Bloomberg colleague Josh Green. Dan, talk about how you see uh, the two front runners, by numbers at least, Trump and Carson tonight. Well, uh, let's start with Trump. Um, when we talk to him, as one does, as one <laughs> often does, as 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 Trump does. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's clear that he realizes he didn't have a great second debate and seems to feel that he needs to do better in this one. So I'll be interested just to see kind of what his style is, what his demeanor is. The degree to which he inserts himself when he's not been asked right, to insert himself. Right, which he didn't do much in the second debate. Right, and, uh, and, and also the degree to which he decides he needs to do something to take down uh, Ben Carson. Yeah. So that, and Carson is a mystery. I mean, he, he's a mystery in a lot of these debates. His demeanor never changes. Um, never answer, once fought his way into the discussion. <laughs> ne doesn't, doesn't try to, and, and seems to come out of them. Uh, certainly not diminished and, as we've seen over the last few weeks, enhanced. So I would assume he will try to continue to do what he does. He will parry a little bit, but not not overly aggressively. Doesn't but try to fight in the conversation, but notably when we saw him at the end of last week, he was sort of wanting more time, kind of craving the idea of getting some more time on stage. My question for you, Josh, as a guy who works for a magazine called Business Week, this is a business and economics focused debate. There are two business people on stage, Donald Trump, Carly Fiorina. Is this not like home field advantage for them? And what do they need to do to take advantage of what should be a natural setting for them and issues that should resonate with them a lot? Well, I think Fiorina will probably be sharp. I mean, this really is her comfort zone. What she's got to do is stand out in the way she has in previous debates. Uh, you know, her, her, her poll numbers have fallen a little bit. She's come, come out of the spotlight. Trump is a fascinating figure to me because the, the times he got quiet last debate are when the, the discussion turned to policy. I talked to some of his, his advisors and they said, you know, this could be a problem for him. He's a developer. He doesn't really think and talk about economic policy. He's not fluent in that. We're not sure how well he knows his own tax plan. So I think one of the big questions is, will he be able to el elbow his way into discussion and contribute anything other than personal right. attacks? And, and I think there's an interesting question about Fiorina. Clearly, this should be an area of, of comfort for her. But if you think about what's been effective for her in the first two debates, it's not been business issues. Well, it's been and so, almost everything. Well, but let's everything get, stop for one second. A little breaking news. The House just passed the budget compromise between the White House and Republican leaders. Heads over to the Senate now where it's also expected to pass. So that's a big development for every player in Washington. And that budget pact will certainly be a topic here tonight. But Dan, let me, let me actually just stay on this point. One of the things that's true about Fiorina is that she has been able in previous debates, when she's been questioned on her business record, which is mixed, she's been able to kind of do a lot of hand waving and talk about things like, well, we grew. And no, 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 no. And the moderators are not necessarily capable of questioning her in a detailed way about her actual performance at HP or Lucent. Tonight, does she actually have more at risk actually talking to some moderators who know more about business than previous ones did? I, I think it will come not only from the moderators, and I think they will be well prepped on the kinds of follow-up questions that need to be asked, but I would suspect some of her opponents as well will be able to uh, go after her. On Let that. me ask you both. There's a lot of audiences tonight, and obviously the press is an audience and the general public, but donors are a huge audience, right? A lot of these candidates now are going to live or die on what comes out of these debates. Is the performance something that donors care about, or do they only care about if the poll numbers move off the performance? I think it is in the case in particular of Jeb Bush's donors. You know, when I talk to Republicans, Republican money people, they are nervous. We all know they're nervous. If Jeb has a standout performance, I think that helps to reassure them. If he struggles, as he has in past debates, will they feel tempted to move to somebody like a Marco Rubio, who seems to have you know, more of a commanding presence and maybe a better shot 
at being the establishment candidate. I, I think that donors tend to be very much weather veins. Uh, and if, if the polls change or if there's a kind of a conventional wisdom that congeals fairly quickly at the end of the debate or in the next couple of days, uh, that will affect the view of the donors and what they decide to do. Josh has brought up Jeb Bush, a lot of focus on Jeb Bush here. A guy behind me in the filing center, I heard do an interview and he's like, this is do or die for Jeb Bush, tonight is make or break. And I never believed that generally about any one, in, any one night in politics. But you, Dan, given everything you've seen, is this really not necessarily do or die, but is it, how big is this for Jeb Bush? It's, it's pretty big, but I, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think any single event is ever do or die, particularly when we're, what, 90 X days away from the first voting. Right. Uh, I mean, there's just so much time that things, other things can happen, but there's no question that given everything he's been through and given the, the cutbacks in the campaign, there is a tremendous amount of focus on what kind of a candidate can he really be? Can he personally step up? All of the, all of the criticism for all of the problems the campaign has had has really been aimed at Jeb Bush as a candidate. Let me ask you about John Kasich, who you've covered for a long time. That is his outburst yesterday and the frustration he's feeling. Is that genuine or is that his strategist John Weaver saying we need to do something a little different and shake I, things I, up? I asked myself the same question and my, my first inclination was John Weaver got to him. Yeah. But I also think, as you guys know, who have covered him also, that that's also a lot of who John Kasich is. John Kasich likes to kind of, you know, call a halt to things or throw a flag on things or, or claim that everybody's, you know, not doing it the right way. So I think that there was some simpatico there between John Weaver and John Kasich. There's been a lot of uh, uh, buzz around Marco Rubio over the past. Everyone now talking about Rubio, Rubio, Rubio. Also, some buzz on the edges about Ted Cruz. What do you think those two guys have to accomplish here tonight, Josh? I think Rubio is not going to sneak up on people the way he has in past debates. He's given a strong performance, and yet he seemed to be out of the crosshairs of people like Trump and Chris Christie, who are really kind of um, battling and making some noise. Now he isn't. He's sort of the, uh, I think, beltway consensus if wise the man. If the moderators give Bush a chance to hit Ru uh, Rubio, do you think he will? I think he will. I, I think I think Bush has internalized the idea that he needs to make a mark, and the way you do that in a debate often is to is to hit somebody. And quickly on Cruz, and then we got to go. And on Cruz, I don't know. He, he's got a strategy where he hangs back. He doesn't have to worry about money. He's running a pretty smooth campaign, and he's a fantastic debater, which we haven't really seen a lot of flashes of. It. I think he can slide by if he needs to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Dan Balls, Josh Green, thank you, too. Enjoy the debates, the undercard, and then the main event. That's two guests down, six more to go. We'll roll the next pair in right after this. We are live 24-7 on BloombergPolitics.com, and we are on the tube twice a day at 5 and at 8. Thanks for watching. Until tomorrow, sayonara. Oh, no, no, not so fast, big boy. We're on for another half hour tonight. Barry Bennett of the Carson campaign, Rick Tyler of Team Cruz, more great guests. Coming up here, a special hour edition, live from Boulder, continues right after this. Wow, I totally am way too stunned. I forgot about this. I'm talking about it. It's the walking debt, and that is a Halloween joke, my friends. We're joined now by former Senator Alan Simpson, one half of the leadership team of the fabled simpson Bowles Commission, as well as Maya McGinnis, the president of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. People, welcome to Boulder. Uh, Senator Simpson, I want to ask you about some news of day, uh, just to start yeah, off. What you made some news today by endorsing, by endorsing Jeb Bush. I did. Tell us why you did that. Well, I've known his daddy and mommy since 1962. I was on the Presidential Debate Commission and felt that was a total conflict to have picked a guy in my own head and not get involved. So, and I also thought to myself, I think that if I'm going to vote for somebody for president, I would pick a guy who has dealt with agencies and screwballs and poops and all sorts of people for eight years. Right. I think anybody in America who decides to vote for somebody that's had three days or three years or three months or three years in the U.S. Senate or nothing else, I think you're going to pay through the nose right. the next time. And I don't care what Jeb Bush, all the stuff about his family and all the, 
the latest, you know, all the crap that goes with right. this stuff. Who's up and who's down, you know, give me a break. I gotta, been there. I gotta say, I felt like that when yesterday I saw his uh, entitlement reform program come out and very explicitly said that it had borrowed a lot from Simpson Bulls. And then the next day to see you endorsing him, I thought like maybe the fix was in a little bit there. <laughs> oh. No, no, but he's he's embraced that for a long time. Bowles and I have visited with him before. We actually go to people who we think are going to run for president, and we've said to them, what do you think of Simpson Bowles? And they do the amazing Adagio dance. It's an arabesque. <laughs> it's off through the hills and through the dales. They don't quite get it, but they're shaking the tin cup yeah. wanting the money. Yeah. Ask them about Simpson Bowles the next time. But I tell you, I'd rather pick a guy with experience. If we haven't learned the game, to pick a guy with no experience, Democrat or Republican, you're going to pay a serious price. Pick somebody who's done the job, paid their dues, actually produced some kind of a representative, effective government. That's me. I don't come from I guess I know you, you probably don't love everything in this budget deal that's been struck, but which parts of it, both in their specifics and in the fact that it's being struck, encourage you about longer-term deficit reduction? We, Tell had them, a, we had to have a budget deal because we had to lift the debt ceiling. The whole notion that we've been messing around with the debt ceiling in these past times is dangerous and costly to the economy. We also should uh, replace the sequester, which is really kind of stupid, across the board, non-targeted spending but it did, cuts, but it did and replace spending. it. Right, we should replace it with smarter savings. What do I not like about the deal? Unfortunately, it's gimmick filled, and that's what's happening too often in Washington. As it turns out, only half of this deal is paid for. So it's actually a deal that's lifting the debt ceiling in return for increasing spending. That's not how it's supposed to work. The debt ceiling is a reminder that we need to make changes to our fiscal policy. And everyone's going to be holding hands and saying, see, we can be bipartisan. But what suffers is we end up borrowing more and adding more to the debt. I wish the discussion were, how do we get the debt under control? Let me ask each one of you real quick to give me your top two Republican candidates in terms of your issues, just great, great, give, give me your two picks who are best on your issues. You start. I can't give you two. Bush, Kasich, and Christie have all put forward specific entitlement plans. That's really important. What I'm not a fan of across the board is these tax plans that would lose revenues. We're talking about losing trillions of revenues when we cannot afford it. We need to figure out how to fix the debt, how to pay for new priorities. Fixing entitlements is tough and real, and I admire people who are willing to talk about so specifics. Who's, so who's got the worst tax plan on that on that measure? That'd be Donald Trump. Um, well, uh, the thing that's appalling is to have Grover Norquist riding through the hills with his white robe on, getting this commitment from people. Who the, why the hell would you ever commit yourself to something you've never seen? And there he is getting these names. I understand Case had signed on. I never signed anything that I didn't get into before I had a debate. I mean, that's madness. In all your years of politics, what have you seen that's like Donald Trump? What have I seen? That's like Donald Trump. Or anything but like Donald Trump. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it, and I don't have any hair. But I'll tell you, he's got a real head of hair, and we have to admire that. We can't <laughs> knock it. But I tell you, I know who he is. I've met him. He failed me on the street one day. He says, Simpson, I want to talk about immigration reform. I got out of this cab. He was very interested because he's got a lot of yeah. people who work for him who might be undocumented. But he, he, he... He, he's at the top of his game because he's striking at the heart of political correctness. And people are so sick and tired of political correctness. Every time he does one of those things to stick it to some shibboleth about, you know, whatever, they love it. That could get you the Simpson vote. You're not big on political correctness. I have a definition for it, but my wife may be listening to this program, and I cannot. I threw you through that. You yeah. threw that away. That was we what I was We get things off the say. set when we don't like them. <laughs> well, but that's why you tried to get rid of me. Well, no, but political you watch it, you'll be next. is a doctrine fostered by a delusional, illogical minority and rapidly promoted by crazy people. I what won't would, go what, into it. What would please you the most to hear from the stage today, stage tonight? I would like to have a question directed at any one of them. What the hell are you going to do about the national debt buster? And it's then gonna, watch them do the dance. It's going to come up tonight and for 241 sure. 241 questions have been asked to these guys in this 
wretched excess of a campaign, and not one has said, what are you going to do about the it's national debt? It's coming up tonight. All I right. bet it's coming up. Uh, Senator Alan Simpson, just for giving us the adagio dance and the image of Gervin Orcus in a white robe on a horse, that's enough for me. Miami McGinnis, thank you for being sane and, and, and not quite as goofy, <laughs> not, quite as, not quite as fanciful as this man. She's the warrior. Uh, coming up next, we have the killer C's. Surrogates from Team Carson and Team Cruz after these words from our sponsors. Back in Boulder, we're joined now by Ben Carson's campaign manager, Barry Bennett, as well as Rick Tyler, a spokesman and advisor to Ted Cruz and his campaign. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. I want to ask you not about the debate for, for, at first, but about the campaign. I want each of you, starting Barry with you, tell me the smartest thing the Cruz campaign is doing, tactically, strategically, messaging, whatever. Oh, I, and think then the same started, for you. I think the way they started was the smartest. I think going to Liberty and announcing early was very smart. Yeah. What's the smartest thing Dr. Carson's operation? Raising lots of money. <laughs> How are they doing it? Why are they raising so You'd much? You'd have to ask him. It looks like they're... What does it look like to you? Every which way we can. <laughs> it, it, it looks like people want an outsider. What I would say about Cruz is he's the original outsider. So people definitely want an outsider. That's what our party wants. So as you guys come into this debate tonight, and this is like a question that you could answer in the worst kind of like talking pointsy, spinny way. But I'm going to ask but it don't anyway. do that. Please don't do that, though. <laughs> you know, you're coming into the debate in different places. I just want to hear, like, tonight, what's a win for Dr. Carson tonight from this stage? You know, if he shows a little bit of personality, and uh, looks like the likable, funny guy that he is, it's a huge win. What about you, Rick? You know, I'm hoping for a substantive debate, um, I th and we're, we're promised one, an economic policy, and I think if we get into a lot of good detail in economic policy and how we're going to get this country out of the, uh, the economic doldrums that it's been in for the last uh, six and a half years, uh, I think um, Senator Cruz would do really well with that. Do you think, do you, Julian, just going back to your point, just do you think that voters now, obviously, uh, Dr. Carson's on the rise right now. He's having, he's on a right, great run. Right, right. Do you think that, that that, with you guys, it's not humanizing him exactly, which is a challenge for a lot of candidates. Right. But there's elements of his personality that people that don't come through or have not come through maybe as strongly as you would like. Right. How, how much of a challenge is that to get him to be the person that you see in private right. and convey that to voters? Uh, you know, it's not a challenge. Media helps, right? I mean, uh, now that we can do a lot of television shows and show a lot of people his life story and, and he gets to see his personality, that's great. Uh, and, you know, that, that's we're all outsiders. We all want the same things, right? We want to we want to burn Washington to the ground. It's just a question of what day we want to start the fire, right? So uh, I think, you know, showing out who he is, what he's, where he comes from, he's been hungry, he's been homeless. He, you know, rose from nothing to one of the world's most uh, um, uh, most serious brain brain surgeons. Um, it's a great story. I'm pretty sure I know what you both think privately. So once again, I'm going to try to get that as opposed to your television spin. Uh, and I'm going to break my rule and ask you about another campaign. The Bush campaign, life support, deep trouble or dead? Rick? Well, look, you know, I, <laughs> I've long ago abandoned these predictions. People come back. Um, he can certainly come back, but he's going to have to come back in a, in a different way. He's going to have to have a different message. Um, but yeah, I think he can definitely come back. This Very. I think it, I think it's um, it's tough. Uh, part of the problem I don't really think is overcomable. But I mean, you know, he could come back. There's a wide lane in the establishment section that he could hog up a lot of the oxygen there. You don't want to say dead, but you're you're you really think dead. I think that it's you know if with that Rolodex, not to raise more money seems to indicate that there's a problem. You, you both are banking on the assumption that an establishment candidate will not be the nominee. The establishment has produced the nominee going back to President Reagan. Yeah. Do you think an establishment candidate will make it to the finals? Or could it end up being some combination of Cruz, Carson, and Trump in the finals and no establishment <laughs> candidate? Is that I think there'll possible? Be a, I think there'll be a, an establishment candidate, and I think there'll be a conservative candidate. Uh, and we want to be the, that conservative candidate. Uh, and so ultimately, we don't. It's it's interesting because normally we, we watch this right. We usually have an establishment candidate. We know who it is by now. Yeah. And they're well funded. Yeah. And uh, they're all alone. And the conservatives are you know hitting each other. And then whoever survives that goes after the establishment candidate. That's not what's happening now. It's a. Uh, Barry, is there definitely going to be an establishment candidate? Because right now you look at the major ones. Hard to see which one's going to emerge. Exactly. But will yeah. one inevitably emerge? I don't. I don't necessarily think that that is a foregone conclusion. I'm beginning to think that. I mean, um, might not happen. Yeah, I think that as the as the public gets exposed to more and more of the outsiders, they find things that they like in the outsiders. Sure. And uh, I don't know about you, but I mean, we find, you know, the traditional Bush donor 
every day sends an email or a call that comes on board. Um, so I think they're hurting. So one of the things that's great about debates is that they are unpredictable. No one yeah. know what's going to happen. Yeah. You guys obviously all try to figure predict what some of the questions are going to be. Right. There's only one predictable thing about tonight, which is that Donald Trump's going to attack somebody. Yeah. Right? So how much preparation have you done with your candidate in your debate prep to be ready for the attacks from Donald Trump if, if they come? We did spend two hours yesterday with the light heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, <laughs> that ought to help a little. Yeah. But no, I mean, uh, Ben is so comfortable with his own skin. He is so good at uh, putting uh, an attack back on the attacker. Well, you're saying you've done, no, you've done no prep? Oh, of course you've we've done, done prep. But right. I mean, he's not going to attack. What's, There's no what, counterpunch. Well, what's the likeliest thing you think that, that Trump would attack Carson on? Oh, I don't know that you can use the word Trump and likely in the same sentence. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, come on. It's so unpredictable. And what about you guys? You guys spend much time worried about Donald Trump going after Ted Cruz? You know, we've, we've tried to avoid uh, the mashed potatoes and the flying peas and corn, and we haven't picked up any flying peas and corn, and we hope to avoid that as well. Well, Senator Cruz has been very nice to Donald Trump throughout this campaign. Sure, yeah. Who do you, who among the candidates on the stage, who do you think is the one that is likeliest to see it, uh, an advantage in going after Senator Cruz? Well, that, that's, that's what's interesting is, I'm, you know, there's a lot of candidates who clearly want to go after each other, but um, I don't know that... Uh, We've been kind of left alone. Right. right. You don't have an obvious opponent yeah. right now. Like an obvious, you know, there have been obviously rivalries that have emerged well, in this yeah. campaign. We have, you guys have, of, we have lots of opponents. We have George W. Bush. Well, for right. But, yeah. but you please. Well, yeah. <laughs> there will be here tonight. Yes. Let's talk sociology and, and, uh, and humanity here. I hear both your candidates talk all the time about how much they like all the other candidates. Are there real friendships growing in this group of 15? And, and which, if so, which one is your candidates actually friends with as opposed to just cordial to? Well, Ben has known Carly for a long time. On, they've served on boards together, right. so they have a multi-decade relationship. So yeah. that'd be his closest. Yeah. What about Senator Cruz? Senator Cruz has a great relationship with all the candidates, but the ones who obviously he spends most time with are the other, his colleagues, his senators. Uh, and Senator have you heard any stories either from tonight or the previous debate about what's going on when, that, when they're hanging out during the breaks or while they're waiting to go on? It's always collegial, you know, they're, they're having a good time. I think most of them genuinely enjoy it. I know Senator Cruz says he likes being on the debate stage. He's good at it. Uh, you know, so... How closely do your have candidates fun. follow what the press writes about who did well in the debate? Oh, we don't read anything the press says. What about your candidate? <laughs> he, do they say, how'd oh, I do? Yeah. How, how yeah. am I doing? Of in the course, of course. Yeah. We, all wanna, we all want to know. Including your candidate. Yes, uh, of course he Ben does. will ask me how much money we raised, how many Facebook fans we got, um, what social media say. Metrics. He doesn't really care what the New York Times says. <laughs> but one of the things that, that we've experienced in every campaign in the past is that the spouses of the candidates, when they go to these debates, they also form relationships, partly because they're also sort of freaked out by going through the whole thing of their of their husbands or wives, as it were, up on stage. Yeah. How do your candidates' spouses, how have they been experiencing these debates? Have they been getting used to showing up at these events and seeing their, their, their husbands up there uh, in front of all these millions of people? I think she sat with Arnold Schwarzenegger in California, so that was probably a bigger deal than any of the candidates' wives. <laughs> well, Heidi Cruz uh, and Ted Cruz celebrated their daughter's fifth uh, birthday yesterday in, in Denver. So both the girls are here, Heidi and Caroline, they're five and seven. And so they're all together today, kind of chilling out at the hotel and relaxing. And uh, so they enjoy it. Heidi's been a wonderful asset on the campaign. She not only can speak to a lot of different diverse groups and she's out uh, stumping and she's filing a lot of uh, uh, nomination petitions for us, but she's actually raising a lot of money. So she's been really terrific. Your biggest, biggest single worry tonight and don't say none. <laughs> What's your biggest single worry about tonight? You know, I, I don't worry about anything that the senator is going to say because he thinks about this content all the time. My biggest single worry is I, I, I would like for the senator to have more time. You know, the first debate, we were the most Googled can, uh, candidate uh, and told me that people want to hear more from Ted Cruz. So right. I hope CNBC gives people a, a chance to hear more from Ted Cruz. got a lot of time tonight. That's my prediction and the one I'll make. All right, Barry Bennett and Rick Tyler, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Guys. We'll be right back with Mr. John Sununu. You'll see which one when we come back. Supporter of John Kasich and Carly Fiorina's deputy campaign manager, Sarah Flores, after this word from our sponsors. We got one guy that says we ought to take 10 or 11 million people and pick them up. I don't know where we're going to go in their homes, their apartments. We're going to pick them up and we're going to take them to the border and scream at them to get out of our country? I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. That is just crazy. we got people proposing health care reform that's going to leave, I believe, millions of people without adequate health insurance. What has happened to our party? What has happened to the conservative movement? 
man. John Kasich is madder than a Mets fan at Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City last night. Here to talk about Kasich is New Hampshire power broker John Sununu, as well as Carly Fiorina's deputy campaign manager, Sarah Flores. Welcome, Thank people. Thank you. Um, big boy. Um, <laughs> last night, that whole thing. Fake? Oh, not fake. First, first of all, it's not, fraudulent? Not, no. Or genuine, heartfelt, and real? Yeah, not certainly not fake. And he's not mad. This is just a question of comparing and con contrasting policies. Uh, you guys have let too many was, people go out there with, with policies <laughs> that are completely ridiculous, that are never going to happen, never achievable in any way, shape, or form. Deporting 12 million people. That will never happen explain, in, in America. Explain one thing about a tax rate of 10% for everyone explain, in America. These are reasonable points, and, and I'm sure he's outraged about that. But explain one thing about politics to us. Why not say the candidates? Why do this thing about one candidate says this? Why well, not Donald name Trump them? And Carson, sure. well, well, why didn't he say their names? Yeah, right. I, don't Look, I don't I just know. don't understand. I, I don't know. I didn't write this speech. But it's more about the policies that was a written speech? than the individual candidates. So that, that's probably why. This isn't about personality. It's about ideas and policy and who has the experience to actually implement policies that are doable, achievable, and will create economic growth. Sarah, should we assume that tonight your candidate will get as much attention and as much bounce out of this debate as the last one? I think we're still looking forward to introducing Carly to a lot of voters. She's got a lot of solutions to get the economy going and growing again. And I think voters will hear that tonight. I think they'll like what she has to say. Do you think that the, the, this this is, should be home field for her? I don't mean Colorado, but I mean <laughs> I mean the fact that it's a business debate on economic issues in front of CNBC. Do you, what, what are the what are the, the there are obvious advantages? There are some potential disadvantages too. What what is what worries you about this setting and being cl closely questioned on her business record, other things like that? I think Carly's got great answers to all of the questions that she'll get tonight, particularly on the economy, what the solutions are. You know, 75% of Americans think the government is corrupt. And I think that Carly's answer to that is we've got to have someone from outside the political class. We've gone back and forth. It's not about replacing a D with an R. It's about actually getting someone in to fix the system. So, uh, you know, probably the number one thing that anyone on this stage is worried about is being able to get their message out. And I'm confident Carly will do that. Do you both think that this race remains extraordinarily wide open where seven or eight people could still win the nomination? Or are things starting to settle in as we get close to Iowa? Oh, I don't think things have really, really settled out at all. You can look at what happened in the polls this year with Donald Trump sort of falling back and and uh, nobody's really got a stranglehold on it. I, I don't know if it's six or seven, but I think there are probably realistically three can or four people be the nominee? that can win. I think it'll be very difficult because she doesn't have any real practical policy experience. Having no practical policy experience is fine if you're running for Congress, but we're talking about commander in chief. Can his and, candidate, and, can his, and we just went through on the job training for eight years and it was a disaster. Can his candidate the be the American nominee? American people are sick and tired of politicians yeah. saying that this is a professional political class and you have to be a professional politician. It's just not but true. No, it's Carly not was class. the head of the external no. advisory board of the CIA. She's advised secretaries of state defense. She knows more foreign policy leaders than anyone else on that stage. So to say that she doesn't have the experience. So can a guy who's no. chairman of the budget it's, committee and now a governor, can he be nominated now? I think the American people are looking for someone who hasn't spent their entire life within the system. It's not about having a, a political class. It's about having the knowledge and experience and the expertise to get it done and having a record that shows that you can get it done. Obviously, that's, Which I think is that's exactly a, what an enormous has. strength of, of John Kasich. I do not see a, I do not see a Kasich Fiorina or a Fiorina Kasich ticket no, uh, forming here. That, that's not, that's that, it's not for us to decide. No. But no. look, experience and, and a proven record does make a difference, as do like the, the policy ideas so, and ideas Ideas that are actionable can can make a difference in the lives of people and that have been shown to work before. So are we going to see on stage tonight the John Casey from last night? I, I think there'll be a lot of elements of that. Look, 10 days ago, he put forward an economic plan that dealt with reforming the tax code, creating jobs, giving power back to the states, uh, all achievable things, but not even easy things to do. What you saw yesterday was the next logical step, because when you put forward real policy ideas and other people are putting forward crazy ideas, you're going to want to contrast those and make sure that the voters understand what's realistic, what isn't, what's achievable, what isn't, who actually has experience that matters, and who doesn't. I want to ask you the question we asked our previous guests about another campaign, Jeb Bush's campaign. Um, deep trouble, life support, or dead? <laughs> 
Uh, again, I think it's going to be very tough for a sort of consummate political insider. Yeah, but that campaign specifically, deep trouble, life support, or death? Oh, I mean, I'm not in their campaign. I wouldn't know. But when we're out in Iowa and New Hampshire, and we spend a lot of time in those states, uh, voters really are looking for someone from outside what's been going on. Whether it's a D or an R, the system has just been meet, failing meet year a lot, after meet year. Meet a lot of voters out there who talk about their, their hunger and thirst for Jeb Bush? I don't. You know, John, John Sununu, no, he, look, the, the trouble is this. Uh, try, I'd say, sure, is it trouble? Of course. But it, it's simply put, he's got 100% name ID. He has relatively high unfavorables among Republicans. And that makes it really what challenging. Odds, what are the odds on a Bush comeback? Oh, I don't know. I, look, I, I, I'm not a Vegas guy. One in 20? <laughs> one, one in 10? Sununu can't. What, what do you think? What do Sununu, you think the Sununu, odds Sununu are? Sununu cannot Did declare. Answer your own question. On the John Sununu show, I will tell you that. <laughs> that when is that on? <laughs> Sununu can't declare Bush dead because Sununu's guy is lower in the polls than Bush. So no, you don't it's not a matter of where you are in the polls. And, it's, and a little anyway, bit of, it's a little bit of a matter of that. Not at this point in the race. No. Absolutely not. And, and you know the history of, of polls, whether it's Rudy Giuliani or Herman Cain or Michelle Bachman. So at this point, May performance. Back those, the paper when John Kasich rocketed to the top of national polls, you'd say, those polls don't matter whatsoever? Yeah, that's exactly what I said, you know, uh, two months ago, three months ago, after he made his announcement. Was there movement? Sure. Yeah. But it, it tends to be a response to, to headline numbers. It, it's about building an organization, uh, having a vision and the experience to, to do the job. John Kasich has it, and that's why he's going to be right there in New Hampshire in right. January and February. Right. Liar, liar, John Sununu, um, saying the polls <laughs> yeah. don't matter whatsoever. Sarah Flores did not lie, did not do that, so she's the winner of this debate. At this point in the process, later you know matter. national oh, polls mean are meaningless. Uh, John Sununu, Sarah Flores, thank you both. Uh, we are not done yet. Some big news about us when we return after this. After this debate, please check out BloombergPolitics.com for stories that Mark and I will have up with our piping hot takes. Also, starting Monday, we're going permanently to one hour every day. We'll see you Monday. Happy debate. Go Royals. Sayonara.